So getting back to how chemists can have some control over this problem, a lot of it does boil down to uh, the laws of nature. So when you're going to carry out a, a chemical reaction, you have to be thinking about the thermodynamics and the kinetics. So you're starting out a chemical reaction with raw materials that have some intrinsic energy, and then you're converting them to products that have some intrinsic energy. Um, the difference between the, the starting and final products is the thermodynamics. Uh, oftentimes, though, the, to get the reaction to go, you have to go through an unstable transition state, so you have to provide extra energy to get through that, that difficult state to the final product. So you may be having to apply quite a lot of energy to uh, get the reaction to go. And this gets into why the catalysts are important. I think just looking at the midterm results, people understood what catalysts do pretty well, but that's basically to try and bring this, this hump down lower to where the thermodynamic barrier is so that you can use the minimum amount of energy possible to get your reaction to go forward. So this is one of the major tools that you would have at your disposal to intrinsically lower the amount of energy that might be required to make a chemical product or make a process go forward. So uh, catalyst design gives you a huge amount of power. So at this point, I'll try and transition into how energy is affected or how energy accumulates across a product life cycle. So I was just using a uh, sort of a lunch container like you might get from one of the trucks down there, 10 grams of styrofoam. If we go through um, different stages of the process, so the raw materials and manufacturing, polystyrene is coming from styrene. The styrene is made from ethyl benzene. That's made from uh, benzene plus ethene. The benzene comes directly from a crude oil fraction. The ethene comes from a natural gas fraction that contains these other components. And so the energy that's embedded in this final product is basically the sum of all the energy that was used to make these, you know, to extract the raw materials and then go through these very basic refining processes. And so even something that's pretty low on the chemical food chain, the uh, polystyrene, has gone through a really pretty extensive uh, uh, set of technologies here. So there's all kinds of pumping, distillation, compression, purification steps. And thinking about what, what is intrinsic about this in the molecule and what is just technological. So the intrinsic factors are you can't get around you know, the number of carbon atoms that are being incorporated into this, this product. That's something that's absolute. Um, the heat capacity of water, so if you have anything to do with, with steam or, or um, you know, water pur purification, if you're heating and cooling water, you can't get around that, that fundamental value. If there are any separations, if things are having to be separated into oil and water phases, that can't really be changed. And then dealing with the boiling points and vapor pressures, so separating out some of these compounds, those are the intrinsic factors. And so if you're, you know, if you have a choice of getting, say, ethene from, dif or ethylene from different sources, that these are the things you would consider. So uh, if, if ethylene has to be separated from one set of chemicals or another set of chemicals, you can look at some of these factors, the boiling points, vapor pressures, and that will tell you intrinsically whether one process might be more fruitful than another. Then the manufacturing itself, so uh, when you produce the polystyrene, you get these little things, I think they call them nurdles, and uh, you have to uh, basically expand them into something that has shape. So they use either CO2 or HFCs, that's, that's similar to the CFCs we talked about earlier in the class, but they have more uh, hydrogen in them instead of chlorine. And again, so that some of the intrinsic properties you'd have to think about here are, uh, what are the, the polymer properties of polystyrene? It's gonna have some certain temperature where it turns from a glassy material into a melt material. That's something that's entirely physical and chemical. And then the blowing agent itself, like a, a, you know, at what temperature is it a gas? Um, a, how compatible is it with this material? Those are the intrinsic materials. As we go along here, I've, I've started adding up some of the energy that's embedded in just this 10 grams container. So, uh, so far we're up to something like, uh, what is that, a million? Yeah, one million joules, so one megajoule. And most of that so far is embedded in the actual synthesis of the, 
raw material. And then uh, transportation. So you've made this product, but say it's at a factory in Louisiana somewhere. It's got to get up to, to New Haven. That You're either going to put it on a barge, go on a train. It's going to be on a truck somewhere. Uh, so the intrinsic properties here, I mean, there's a lot of circumstantial things about how far you're taking it and so on. But uh, you know, fuel, energy, densities, which one of these things you choose, which fuel you're using, definitely is going to be affecting the overall energy consumption. And so we're adding to the bar here. Uh, transportation is increasing the energy load. The use phase, I mean, you could argue whether you really uh, do anything with the styrofoam. Some people might throw it away. Uh, maybe you rinse it if you're going to put it in the recycling bin. So if you, wash, if you were to wash it for a few seconds with hot water in the sink, uh, you're having to worry about how much energy is used because of the heat capacity of water. So we add another little bar there. And then finally, end of life, uh, something like polystyrene really only has two options. You can incinerate it and get some energy back, or you can landfill it. And depending on which one of these you pick, you could have some energy recovery, because styrofoam is hydrocarbon, it's good fuel. Or you could actually have energy costs. So uh, running a landfill is very energy intensive. You have to maintain it. So I, I was being generous here, so I added a negative bar. So you can get a little bit of energy back at the end if you incinerate. But just adding everything up. So in total, just using, producing and using one of these little styrofoam containers is about a megajoule of energy. Uh, just trying to convert that into something easier to think about. That's like running a light bulb for 24 hours, essentially. So all these products are going to have the energy embedded across all these life cycle stages. And so I, th I think I've basically covered this, but the design implications are that as a chemist, if you're going to be building up a very complex structure from simple raw materials, you have to be aware of the different purification and separation steps. And sometimes as you go through the literature, that may not all be very obvious. They may be starting with a, a raw material that's already pretty complex. But you can, uh, like I said, you can kind of follow it back. Even if they don't have this in a certain paper or publication, you can try and figure out uh, what, its, what its family tree is. Did it come from uh, petroleum in the very beginning? Did it come from coal? Did it come from natural gas? And it should be pretty simple to trace that back. And I, I think that a final point that needs to be made is that you can always think about the function as well. And, and this doesn't have to be polystyrene lunch containers. It could be fragrances. It could be um, a dye or whatever. It, it, if you think about like what the function of that molecule is, it, it's not necessarily, like in the case of the styrofoam container, there's no reason that your lunch container has to be made out of styrene, benzene, and ethylene. That's not the function of it, is you know, to be made out of a certain chemical. It's to provide structure and rigidity and hold your food for, I don't know, 20 minutes. And the same for a fragrance. You know, the fragrance doesn't, it's not a, a requirement that it has to come from a petroleum fraction, right? People don't buy their fragrance because of, you know, it, it came from natural gas or petroleum at the beginning. So they're, they're, I think this gives you some freedom to think about alternatives that uh, you don't always have to be looking for efficiencies in this particular system. You can try and think a little bit more outside.